it's emotion. You know, mm-hmm. you pull on someone's heartstrings, you pull on the emotion of somebody. We saw those in Super Bowl ads for years. And, you know, it went from super funny commercials to really heartfelt commercials. And it's just because the trends of using people's emotions against them to buy something (laughs) is really where it boils down to. You know, it's like, oh, I feel really bad for that puppy in that commercial. Like, (laughs) I guess I should just go buy some dog chow. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. I'm your host, Jody Krangle, and this podcast will discuss just how sound influences our behavior. I generally talk about this in the context of advertising and marketing, but there are other places this is important too. I really feel that it plays a much more important role in our lives than maybe we realize. So let's delve a little deeper. Here's the first part of my interview with Macha Gruber. My next guest is a professional audio producer, voiceover talent, radio imaging producer, and slaying all things audio in Atlanta, Georgia. She has spent the better part of 15 years in audio advertising, writing, voicing, and sound designing creative commercials and imaging for major market terrestrial and streaming radio. Now at the studio at iHeartMedia, she is part of the elite team of creatives making audio magic for national brands and stations across the country. Her name is Macha Gruber, and I've been looking forward to hearing Macha's perspective on the changes in audio branding for a long time now. This is going to be interesting, so get comfortable. I am so excited that we're getting to do this, Macha. This is, like, awesome. <laughs> I know. I am so excited as well. Yeah. Thank like, you so You've much. really built something amazing with this podcast. Well, thank so. you. I Kudos. appreciate that. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and I am learning a ton as I go along, which is fantastic. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure I'm going to learn a ton more after we're done talking, too. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Life's all about a learning process, right? It's all a learning process, yes, definitely. <laughs> so what is going on in your world? I mean, you know, besides the weirdness. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's all kind of weirdness at this yeah. point. Um, I'm very fortunate to be able to work from home, so that's good. Mm-hmm. Our team was able to seamlessly transfer from being in a, you know, glorious, beautiful studio to our glorious, beautiful home studios. Um, we're, we're just really lucky that we're all audio nerds and we had our own setups here at home. <laughs> that is a very good thing. Yeah. And I am certainly disco- uh, discovering that having a home studio has been a real boon right about now. <laughs> oh, for sure. It's for incredible. sure. Um, there are some talents I've talked to who are just like, this was the kick in the pants they needed to get their home studio together because they were never going to work again if they couldn't make it, you know, into a live or you know, into a recording studio. So they're like, well, this was my kick in the pants. And so I just, I I bit the bullet and I built my studio out. I said, that's perfect. Now you'll get more work. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's probably hard for people who've never had to do this. Like I imagine a Mm -hmm. lot of people who live like in the downtown core or whatever the downtown core is of Atlanta, for instance, or LA or New York for that reason, never really had to do that before. Right. So yeah, now yeah, it's it's been interesting. Um, so I have a, a question for you about um, audio production, because I know you've been doing it a long time. But what was your what was your first interest in this? How did you get into it? Um, well, whatever I say is not legally binding. Um, <laughs> I No, it is not. No, <laughs> I was I was asked to be part of a pirate radio station. When um, I was back in college, mm-hmm. <clears throat> this is radio is not my first career. I went to college for something completely different. And that's a whole other story that we could talk about on another time. Oh, um, but I'm happy college... to talk about it any time. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah, let's Go do ahead. it. Let's do it. Um, I moved to Atlanta from New York mm-hmm. um, in 2001 to start going to chiropractic school. Oh, OK. Wow. I have a you know bunch of chiropractors in my family. And it was one of those things where I'm in high school and, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life kind mm-hmm. of moment. And I really liked chiropractic. I really liked, you know, what my cousins were doing or my cousin and her family were doing. And so I said, all right, let's do it. I'm, I'm going to go be a chiropractor for the rest of my life. So I moved to Atlanta, um, you know, two months out of high school, and I started the undergraduate program at chiropractic college down here. Uh, I made it all the way through the, 
the grad or the undergrad. I started the graduate program. I was about a year and a half in and um, my grades were suffering and I couldn't understand why. And I said, you know, to myself, I'm like, well, maybe there's other things out there that I'm just kind of diving myself in because chiropractic can be a little political and a little, you know, biased in certain areas. And like I said, whole other story for a whole sure. other podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was getting I was getting burned out in, you know, because I, I dove deep in and that's what I do. I just, you know, I find something I like and I, I nosedive into it. Sure. No so halfway. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and so I, I started hanging out with uh, a new crew of people that didn't go to my college. Uh, we started going to music shows. I'm a big metal head. So we started going to like metal shows mm -hmm. and I met this whole other genre of people that I've never met before. And it was just like this, this kind of epiphany where it's like, oh, there's a whole other life out there outside of what I'm so focused on right now. Let me try to explore that. A friend of mine was starting a pirate radio station and he said, Matcha, you are super outgoing and you love talking to people. You want to be on my radio show? And I said, no, absolutely <laughs> not. I want nothing to do with radio. I said, are you kidding? I don't... People who are in radio dream about being in radio since they're very little. They record their own voice on their little boom box and, you know, they intro and outro different songs. I never did any of that. I was mm -hmm. just a people person. So he, he convinced me. There, there was a couple of cocktails later, but he convinced me and I <laughs> had my own show. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I had my own show called The Madness. Uh, on his little pirate radio station. And I built that up to a whopping like 70 listeners a week, which was amazing. <laughs> Early podcasting. <And laughs> it, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. It's exactly, it, it was on Shoutcast, like Winamp Shoutcast. Yeah. Okay. I'm definitely dating myself on this one. But, <laughs> um, you know, it was basically what iTunes was before iTunes. And it, mm -hmm. it was all pirated music, pretty much. Because that was the time and the age. But I had nothing to do with all the pirating, FYI, <laughs> if you're listening. Um, but turns out <clears throat> the, 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 the RIAA definitely found out about our little station band of misfit, misfits and uh, they shut us down. Oh, they, yeah. Ouch. They told us we'd have to like back pay and all these royalties if we didn't uh, cease and desist. Wow. But anyway. While I was doing this metal show, I realized that I needed some kind of promotions. And I was like, I could do this. I could make a little promotion for myself. I mm -hmm. downloaded Audacity. Um, and I, I taught myself how to make my first radio imaging promo. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I voiced it. I put little drops and little clips of, you know, whatever I wanted in there, like movie clips and, you know, just like the old school radio kind of style. Mm -hmm. And I had so much fun doing that and teaching myself this brand new program and this brand new platform. And then um, after we got shut down, I said to myself, well, that was fun. Let's keep doing it. And I went to broadcasting school. I dropped ah, out of, I dropped out of chiropractic school <laughs> and I went to broadcasting school because I wanted to be on the radio for the rest of my life. And then I realized that I don't want to be on the radio for the rest of my life because being a disc jockey is very monotonous. Ah. Um, and so I fell in love with the production aspect of it because of, of that, making those little promos in my little one bedroom apartment mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Um, that was the most fun for me than actually introing the music and talking about the music. I had way more fun making the promos and I felt way more creative doing it that way. So, uh, and that's what I learned while I was in broadcasting school as well is that, if I start honing that skill, that could be really interesting for me down the road. And that's how I got here. Uh-huh. And I'll bet it has been interesting. <laughs> uh, it has. It has. I still was on the air a couple times. Uh, uh -huh. I had a few shifts on the air, but we all have to pay our dues. And it really is boring. <laughs> it is. I know so many great DJs and they do such a good job and they are so entertaining. But if how many times can you talk about the same song? How many times can you? What's all okay. this new information you have on the same song? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Especially if you're working for a station that does not play new music. Oh, How many times yeah. can you talk about Enter Sandman from Metallica? You know? Yes. So. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, that I, I see what you mean by monotonous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no offense. Like, like I said, I know so many great DJs and they're all fabulous people. It's mm-hmm. just not my cup of tea for, for a living, at least. Well, uh, you know, going along these lines of of radio and how people are, um, you know, on the radio stations and how the radio stations brand themselves because they all have a certain sound because they're all promoting a certain type of genre of music. Right. So Mm -hmm. have you seen changes in the radio imaging from year to year in I mean, because you've been doing that as well. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Radio imaging is it, it goes so different than what it it is so different than what it used to be Mm -hmm. um you know radio imaging used to be focused around beating the call letters into your head (laughs) okay Um, yeah you know like the with the jingles the z100 you know like with the jingles and with just saying it over and over and over again from the imaging to you know the jock branding to the audio branding um audio branding Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why Shout we're talking. Out. <laughs> Shout out. Yeah, no. Uh, but yeah, so imaging used to be about feeding those call letters into your head, and mm-hmm. it was for ratings because of the book system. So <clears throat> back in the day, I mean, it's some markets still have it, smaller markets still have it, but, it, you know, there was a book that would get sent out to you, and you would have to write down what station you listen to, when, where, what time. You know, and then that helped build the demographics so they can sell more advertising and, you know, they could base their ratings on that. They're the number one rated station in the in the city. And, you know, so that means that they can charge more for their advertising and McDonald's is going to want to be on your station versus the station across the street. That's why imaging exists is Mm -hmm. to let people know this is who we are and, you know, to write this name down in your book without actually saying, I'm sure some people even wrote that into imaging, but write this name down in your book. Um, It was an FCC (laughs) thing. So now radio is a little different, you know, in in the major markets and, you know, the, the larger markets is that it's, it's all digital now. So they're, they wear people meters, like they're called um, per, I'm such a bad radio person. I forgot the name of it, but uh, (laughs) it's, it's a, it's basically a, a meter that you wear on your person and it, it it checks for the radio. So it has a frequency that pulls in the frequency from the radio and it logs what you're listening to and when and where. Um, so it takes your demographic. So you're, a, you know, a woman 18 to 35 and you would be listening to this station at this time. And that that goes, OK, well, Star 94 is 18 to 35, you know, because of all these people that are listening at this time is in the t- this demographic. And they're listening to it more frequently. So we're going to, you know, like the the ratings of it is going to be higher than the station across the street because there's more people listening to it generally. It's not accurate. It's not like super accurate. It's a lot of anomalies where, you know, you walk into a Walmart and there's five stations playing, you know, in the car <laughs> okay, department. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure they have. I, I'm not a, an engineer, like a radio engineer like that, broadcasting engineer. So I don't really know exactly how it all works, mm-hmm. um, but it is different. So the imaging is different as well because you want people to stay tuned and you want people to not tune out as much as you don't want them to remember your name. So what has changed? So now they're not beating the call letters into your head. Mm -hmm. Are they trying to use maybe humor or a certain type of voice or? Yeah, it's familiarity. It's Mm -hmm. um, the voice. It's the the humor as well. You Mm -hmm. know, there's a lot, especially the more edgier stations like to keep it super funny. Um, But anything to really pull you in and keep you there, Mm -hmm. you know, so everything's super quick. Um, You know, the jocks don't have the the 10 minute long breaks anymore the the you know they're in and out in 20 seconds because the span of your attention your attention span isn't going to be as long if you hear someone droning on mm-hmm. so you want to be same thing with your imaging you want to be quick you want to be in you want to be out you want to make a statement you want to talk about what's happening you know there's no 2 minute promos anymore it's all like 30 seconds or less because mm-hmm. that's really the the general attention span of the average human being they don't want to pay attention like it's a lot seven less seconds. than 30 seconds <laughs> it is yeah i think i think the numbers are closer to like seven to ten yeah 
So, it's, you know, I, I think you have to like, take that into account. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, actually, um, I don't know if this is true, but they did a, a study in 2014. And apparently, I, I don't know if this has been debunked or something at this point, but I had heard that they found a goldfish had more attention span than human beings. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I believe it. Yeah. See, I believed oh, I it believe too. It. I, it, it's probably <laughs> been completely debunked by now, but I believed it too because <laughs> not too far out of the realm of possibility, really. <laughs> oh no! Yeah. No. So it's as just far because as... there's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. there's a lot going on. There's a lot to focus on. There's and there's a lot to not focus on too. There's a lot to just throw away. Like we're living in an age where we're surrounded by all the information all the time. We have to pick and choose what to listen to and how to listen to it. Yeah. And so that's you know radio does a really good job of that, of making you actually hone in on what you want to listen to and when. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Radio has a hard time of it now, though. I mean, not a lot of, I mean, people are in their cars, but I'm finding a lot less people are in their cars than used to be in their cars. (laughs) Yeah. Now, yes. But with smart speakers and, you know, smart uh, technology, radio's everywhere now. That's true, actually, which brings us to iHeart because, <laughs> because of course, that is another major way for people to listen to the radio stations, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's hugely popular, I'm assuming. Yeah. When, um, when iHeart Radio was formed, it was this brand new type of thing where it's mm-hmm. like, oh, you could listen to a terrestrial station online, like streaming. That was unheard of at that point. You know, they've really taken it and ran, ran with it. Yeah, I love that idea. You can actually listen to like a a New York station from anywhere, from like Germany, (laughs) if you want to, you know, (laughs) which I think is it's pretty awesome. So how did Mm -hmm. you get into iHeart, iHeart Media then? Like, because this has been a progression, you know, from (laughs) audio engineering and the radio and all of that. So how did iHeart come up? Um, I... I interned. Uh, it was called Clear Channel at the time. Uh, of course, yes. But my first, my first station I interned for was uh, a Clear Channel property, which then turned into iHeart when they changed names. So, um, yeah, I've worked for iHeart my entire career. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It was. I I interned at the Rock Station here in Atlanta, Project Nine Six One, and then they literally had to kick me out of the building because my internship ended like six months before. I, I wanted to leave. Aww. And so they <laughs> we were just talking about that online the other day. I said, can you remember which one of you actually had to tell me to leave? And they're like, I can't remember. <laughs> but because I was so hungry for it, I wouldn't leave the station. I just kept showing up. Mm-hmm. I said, give me work to do. I want to I want to do work. Well, um, I guess that's how you make yourself indispensable, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> just keep yeah, showing go, up. Oh, no, <laughs> we probably should tell her to go home. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so um, that was my first internship was a Clear Channel property. And then uh, I got my first job was uh, I was working on air down in Columbus, Georgia. I was commuting. OK. Uh, I, I went down because I, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the geography of it, but uh, Columbus, Georgia is about an hour and a half south of Atlanta, Georgia. OK. It's another bigger city, but not like it's not like Atlanta size. It's, you know. It's another, uh, it's like Macon, Augusta, Mm -hmm. or Columbus. Anyway, so um, I made friends with the Midday Girl there. Shout out Dawn Cox. And she uh, let me stay with her three days a week. So I drove down there. I left at like four in the morning. And I would drive down there. I would babysit the morning show that they had on air. And uh, that was like my main job. I was, you know, the, the morning show producer. Even though they were in North Carolina and so I would have to sit and make sure all their commercials fired and make sure that, you know, <laughs> sure. no one is screwing up and write copy for them that mm-hmm. they would have to read on our local liners. And um, I would take a nap in my car. Midday girl would show up and then I would get her breakfast and I would take a nap in my car and then come back to work, do my night shift from seven to midnight and write some imaging and do some, you know, commercial production and then go to sleep and wake up at, you know, 5 a.m. and do it all again. Wow. And then I would leave that Friday to go back home to do it all again on Wednesday. Yeah, it was crazy. That is dedication. So, wow. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
I'm telling you, I nose dive into everything I do. Uh, yeah, it definitely sounds like it, which is fantastic because, I mean, you get a lot done in a short period of time, I would imagine. <laughs> I don't know. Working 50 hours in, in three days is quite the undertaking. Yes. Yes, it is. Are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact? You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up, though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that, too. Now, back to the podcast. Um, but, but yeah, but that, yeah. to answer your question, that was a Clear Channel property also. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got laid off from there and I went and I worked in the real world for a couple of years and I honed my skills and I kept producing like imaging and commercials just on my own. And I had this little team of, of friends and colleagues that I would just use as ears, you know, just uh, experienced people, people that I trusted and admired. And I would make something and I would throw it their way and say, give me some tips. And they would. And so, you know, they they helped me along the way and, and gave me some really good knowledge and really good advice and constructive criticism. And I was very fortunate to have a, a bunch of people who believed in me in the industry to help. That's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's super helpful. So when did you start doing demos for, for voice talent? Because I know that you have been a voice talent and are a voice talent yourself. So mm -hmm. How did all that come about? Like, did you just start doing the imaging on these radio stations that you were working with or? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've imaged every station I worked for, um, mm -hmm. whether it be, it wasn't, it was never full time. It was always, you know, I would, I would be working on commercials and then I would just do imaging because I was there and, and I could do it. Mm -hmm. um, I was never actually hired as an imaging director for anything specifically because that, that's a very rare term nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, Everyone has all these different hats in radio. Mm -hmm. So, but I did it enough to where, you know, I'm proficient at it. And I've worked with enough talent to where I'm proficient at that as well. And then uh, in 2017, oh God, I can't even remember. <laughs> I feel like I've been in my house for 10 years. Um, <laughs> Every month 20... is like a year, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 27, 2017, I got laid off again. Because I went, I went back to iHeart, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then I got laid off again. Um, and that was, you know, just a general. I didn't do anything wrong. As we needed to cut costs somewhere, yep. and I was on that line. I gather and that happens said, a lot in radio. <laughs> uh huh. And then I was approached by a few different um, colleagues in the voiceover world, and um, you know, they they asked me if I would want to do a demo for them, and they loved my work, and they wanted my work on their demos, and I said. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but okay, <laughs> let's well, do it. Apparently, you did it great. So, <laughs> well, thanks. Um, I learned that was another learning process that I dove nose first into. Mm -hmm. You know, it was another one of those things where I I, I knew some. Uh, I've heard other other work from other people who had demos that that weren't the greatest, and I I was like, hey, I can make that better. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, I've worked in commercial before, you know, commercial radio is is my gig. That's what I do. Sure. And being a commercial producer, I think you should know what commercial production is all about. Yes. And definitely. that's what demos are. You mm -hmm. know, demo, demos are a showcase of how you sound on commercials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and then imaging and then narrations. Just all a learning process. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So in iHeart, and you're you're talking about producing commercials, mm -hmm. have you seen any trends since when you first started doing those those commercials? And when I ask about trends, I mean, 
type of copy, type of voice, type of, I mean, music obviously changes, but, you know, tone, um, how upfront the voice is or, you know, things like, like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the millennial craze definitely took commercial, uh, commercials to a different level. Mm -hmm. where, you know, you instead of it, when I started about 15 years ago, it was very much informational. Mm -hmm. So here's the information. And here is, you know, what we want to tell you, and what we're selling you and why we're selling it to you and why you should buy this. Um, Now, uh, it's actually it's changing again. I'll give it that it's changing again. But um, when the millennial craze came up, it turned into I don't care if you buy this. I just want you to listen to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I I really don't care. You can make your own decisions. You have all the information at your fingertips. You can research this on your own. I just don't care. But here, if you want to buy this, sure, go for it. And it's just (laughs) turned into very, it turned into very much lackadaisical, Mm -hmm. you know, like not in your face, just mention the brand name, just, you know, make, someone listen real quick with a quip uh, humor or, you know, something interesting or a lot of those, you know, like the, the talk back, like, Bob, you're not supposed to say that on the radio kind of thing. Those are yeah. all gone. Uh-huh. You know, like the announcer voices are all gone. Um, you know, so it turned into a real people. Real people is the word that you'll see everywhere you audition is mm-hmm. conversational, natural, yep. uh, talking to a friend, you know, because nobody wants to be talked to anymore. They mm-hmm. want to be talking with. Yeah. I've had this discussion with a lot of people uh, and they all mention that, yeah, it's that undersell almost because mm-hmm. like everyone's bs meters are so high right oh, yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. So oh, I yeah. can see, I can see how that would, that would have uh, been a, a trend, definitely, and mm-hmm. still continues. But you did it mention does. it's changing, right? So how it is, is it changing now? It's changing back to more informative. It's changing back mm-hmm. to, um, at least from what I've seen, because of COVID, because of we're here with you and everyone's making the jokes, you know, in these trying times and <laughs> yeah. in these things, you know, it's heartfelt kind of has its own its own way of bringing itself back because it's emotion. You know, mm-hmm. you pull on someone's heartstrings, you pull on the emotion of somebody. We saw those in Super Bowl ads for years. And, you know, it went from super funny commercials to really heartfelt commercials. And it's just because the trends of using people's emotions against them to buy something <laughs> is yeah. really where it boils down to. You know, it's like, oh, I feel really bad for that puppy in that commercial. Like, oh, I guess I should just go buy some dog chow. You know, like, that puppy made me sad. Sarah well, McLaughlin, perfect example. Pardon? Yeah. Sorry? I said perfect example, Sarah McLaughlin oh, in the arms yes. of an angel. Oh, my goodness. That song is forever tied. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't hear that song without seeing these puppies, you yeah. know, covered in flies. It's It's awful. But <laughs> it's, it's pretty, yeah, you're you're very right there. That's amazing. But that's good advertising, regardless it if it's nonprofit or not. It's good advertising because 20 years later, we're still talking about it. Well, that's audio branding, right? I mean, they exactly they took mm-hmm. that song and they made it a part of their brand, and it's now forever associated. And for sure, that's that's awesome. That's the point of of doing these things. I mean, if you're If you're going to promote a brand, you want that brand to be memorable in some way, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's not memorable, and especially on the on the radio, I mean, you don't have any other way of mentioning it other than sound. (laughs) Absolutely. So you have to find some way to to make it work. So Mm -hmm. in the production of um, commercial work, then what are some of the are there some tricks of the trade that make a, a commercial more memorable, for instance? The writing. Yeah. Like the writing is always first. It has to be written well, because mm-hmm. if it's not written well, the performance is going to suffer because the, the message isn't clear. If the message isn't clear and the performance suffers. The back end of it's going to suffer as well because you're Frankensteining pieces together 
of different parts and pieces of, oh, well, I guess this take sounded better than this take on this one, but it all starts with the writing mm-hmm. for sure. Um, and then in the audio side of it, um, you know, it, it has to it has to sound coherent and it has to sound as natural as possible without it being over the top and trying to convey the theater of the mind on on where the writer wanted to go with it. So, you know, if it's some kind of dialogue spot, you know, you want to make sure that you have that dialogue timed right. You want to make sure you have like as a voiceover actor, you know, that a lot of times when you do dialogue, you're not in the same room with mm-hmm. the person. Yeah. All the times now that you do dialogue, you're not in <laughs> yeah. the same room with that person. And it's very rare that they do two two voiceover sessions. They do it, but it's not often. Um, so, you know, you have to pretend like someone's answering that question or there's a director on the other line answering that question for you. And you have to be as natural as you possibly can in this dialogue. And then it's the producer's job to make sure that those spaces are as natural as they can in that dialogue. And it's a nuance that a lot of people don't understand unless you work in the audio itself is that nuance of, yeah, I'm removing this breath and I'm removing the um, pushing you guys closer together in a natural, but it has to sound right to the ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if it's too close, it won't sound right. If it's too far away, it won't sound right. You know? Yeah. So very good point. You have to have a a good um, knowledge on how speech works and how dialogue and conversation work. And just like how we're speaking right now, I, I, I stammer a lot. I'm not a very clear, you know, (laughs) I'm going to speak all these words are going to come out of my mouth and they're going to be perfect Mm -hmm. because my brain doesn't work like that. So if I'm I'm producing, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. It goes back to uh, not having the attention span of a goldfish. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it definitely does. Yeah. <laughs> so but, yeah. when you're putting that together, when you're putting people's speech patterns together, and especially how natural and conversational everything has to sound nowadays, you have to be very cognizant of your spacing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can see how that would be an interesting challenge. So mm-hmm. so writing for conversation, is there, there's got to be an art to that. <laughs> Cause, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's so is that something that like writers actually like get training in or is it something that they just get better at as they do it? Because uh, I know writing spots for radio is different than writing spots for TV or for video, for instance. In, in some ways, yes. And in some ways, no. You know, I mean, it just depends on what spot you're trying to, to write. Mm-hmm. You know, that you've seen plenty of the pharmaceutical spots where it's just voiceover and mm-hmm. just a whole bunch of, you know, uh, Getty image clips or wherever they come from. <laughs> yeah. You know, the stock fo- the stock footage. True. Mm. Yes. <laughs> we saw a lot of that during COVID. Stock oh, yeah. footage. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. And, but, and um, lovely, heartfelt piano music. <laughs> oh, yes. In these trying times. Oh, yes. We are together. We're all one. together. But apart. <laughs> But six feet apart. Yes. Stay away from me. Do not come near me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the, yeah. the the point that I was making there, I guess, is that because you do have those images, you mm-hmm. maybe don't need to have as much theater of the mind for the video than you may have to for a, a radio spot like you Correct. you really need to get into the head of whoever this character is that's speaking when you're in Correct. a radio commercial as opposed oh, to yeah. you know being underneath the images when you're doing mm-hmm. stuff for a video so like it, I, I guess like the video writing ends up looking more like a haiku <laughs> well yeah and in the, in the video you can get away with a lot more with Mm -hmm. images yeah you're absolutely right because in radio you have to explain everything that's happening whether it's within sound effects or sound design or you know the pregnant pauses of someone just kind of being awkward or you know it's it is it is different in that aspect but it can be translated if it's done right you know Mm -hmm. I've, i've heard plenty of TV commercials, all the audio from a TV commercial run on radio. Mm-hmm. So it just depends on on the plans and the the writers themselves can, um, you know, can can work that out with whatever they're doing. You know, there's there's copywriters, there's radio copywriters. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so some some copywriters can't write for radio and some, you know, vice versa. It just depends. 
Yeah, you know? yeah. It, writing it for the a... human speech is is hard enough, <laughs> let yes. alone writing for human speech with no visuals. That is very true. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into that. I've always thought it's a, a an incredible skill to be able to write a radio commercial. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's. It's a lot of theater of the mind. And as you said, you have to explain everything. So, oh, yeah. yeah. And it better yeah. be good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, so. Even small stuff, bringing it back to the audio side, mm -hmm. small stuff like opening a door, you know, like walking across the room. Is that door still open? Mm -hmm. You know, did you did you fling open this door in your parents' house to to welcome them into your part or did your parents fling open your door in your house to welcome themselves into a party and not shut it? You know, and it doesn't sound right if yeah. the door doesn't shut. That's one of my my biggest pet peeves. If a door doesn't shut, mm -hmm. unless unless you're walking into a room, not a house. If you're walking into a room, that's a little different because you could just open a door and I'm in the room now and you're inside the house. But if you're knocking on the front door and someone lets you in. The door has to close yes. behind you because then it's just wide open and you are raised in a barn. <laughs> <laughs> that is an awesome point and not one I had ever considered before. But I, yeah, mm -hmm. the sound design is really important in these theater of the mind pieces. Absolutely. Because you, yeah. have to, you have to build that theater in your mind while you're listening to it. It's like just the, the simple act of a key opening a door, but the key has to jingle. Because mm -hmm. there's on, it's not going to be just one key, so it's going to be on a key ring. Mm -hmm. So that key is going to jingle, but the the lock has to unlock. But the keys are still jingling because they're still moving with the lock. So, and then that door opens, the door shuts, but there's also footsteps because you have to walk inside the house, and then you have to walk around the house. Like it just doesn't sound right if mm -hmm. those little tiny nuances aren't there. Yeah. It's kind of like building a, a film score, I guess, like a mm -hmm. like Foley. <laughs> that, that's how I see it. Yeah. I, I see it as that where in order to have true theater, theater of the mind, you need to actually create that stage. Mm -hmm. You need to create that environment. If you're outside, you know, there has to be a bird or something somewhere or a lawnmower going by, you know, yeah. to, to really tell that you're outside. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're at the beach, there has to be seagulls. What what beach doesn't have sequels? That's you very know what true. I mean. Yeah. So there's certain aspects and elements that have to go into that sound design with radio because you can't see it. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Um. So along these lines, I'm I'm curious how much the clients get involved in the sound design. Do they have specific audio that they like to use? Do they have particular uh, emotional music they like to use? Um, you know, is there something that they tell you that they really need? Or do you guys just build it from scratch and then say, what do you think? It's a case by case basis, uh, depending on who's involved and how involved the creative team on their side wants to be. Mm -hmm. Some people will give us explicit instructions on, you know, it has to have this kind of music and this kind of voice and this kind, you know, um, others are just like, nope, we, we trust your expertise and you do what you want, cast who you want, produce it how you want. And then we send, you know, we send it to them and they either love it or they don't. And we try again. So it just all depends. Uh, we work in such a fast environment where, you know, we'll, we'll get a project and it'll be less than a couple of days before it's turned around. Um, and that's actually a little bit longer than a lot of people have in radio because, mm -hmm. you know, on the local level, a lot of local producers only have hours to turn things around. So we're fortunate that we have a little more leeway. But still, I mean, compared to how long it takes to do these big national campaigns from these big national, you know, um, production studios, it could take months to do the perfect campaign. And, and we turn it around in days. That's so amazing. it just really, it really, <laughs> I'm not saying that to toot our own horn. No, um, but I but mean, we, yeah, we're accustomed to working that fast. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, it and is that's amazing. just the nature. <laughs> yeah. That's just the nature of radio. You just want to get as many clients in and out as you can because, you know, the clients are paying our paychecks. Yeah. You know, yeah. They're, they're the boss. They, yeah. they need to, you know, they need to get their stuff in. Um, we want to make them the happiest we can too. Definitely. So when they come to us, you know, it's, it can go either way. And we're all on the team for a reason to, you know, because if if they don't have any type of 
design or any type of ideas in their head. We're the ones who have to come up with it. So. Mm -hmm. This has been part one of our interview. I hope you'll tune in next week for part two. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available on all the usual outlets. Until next time.